this is human warnings. This will be a ramble, and if you don't like the deep end, then go back to the shallow end. Introduction to Fuchs. First of all, I'm no expert on this subject, so I will make mistakes. Secondly, this is like doing like introduction to the Bible, where there's just too much to talk about, so there's no way you can do it. So this is fraught with uh, mistakes. It's, it's a ill, but you know what? It's good for anybody that wants to learn like the basics, like an introduction to Fuchs. So there you go. Even if I'm wrong, at least I'm I'm 99% of what I'm saying is right. A lecturer once said about the Divine Comedy that you've never read the Divine Comedy until the second time you read it. Because there's just so much. People have put their whole careers into the Divine Comedy, theorizing on it. And likewise, uh, the study of Counterpoint by Fuchs is not the kind of book where you read it once and it's just nothing. It's the Bible for how to learn um, music. Okay, so I'm just going to first simply read what it says on the back. The most celebrated book on counterpoint is Fuchs's great theoretical work, Gratis ad Parnassum. Since, since its appearance in 1725, it has been used by and has directly influenced the work of many of the greatest composers. J.S. Bach held it in high esteem. Leopold Mozart trained his famous son from its pages. Haydn worked with worked out every lesson with meticulous care, and Beethoven condensed it into an abstract for ready reference. An impressive list of 19th century composers subscribed to its second edition, and in more recent times, Paul Hindemith th- said, uh, perhaps the craft of composition would have fallen into decline if Fuchs's gratis had not uh, set up a standard. So Fuchs wrote this book, with no knowledge of J.S. Bach's, Johann Sebastian Bach's existence. He did this, he wrote this, and he based the idea of perfect music on a composer named Palestrina. It's the first thing to know. For a long time, people thought that this book was teaching how to write music, whereas about 80 years ago, 100 years ago, another theorist named Schenker, who I'm going to get into later, he announced that this is counterpoint, which I guess this this book invented. Counterpoint is not a style of music. Um, it is simply an exercise. It's it's a way of practicing music theory. But counterpoint itself is not. You don't just you don't say things like, "Oh, that that thing has a lot of counterpoint in it." It's the same with the idea of fugue. Like, "Oh, that had fugal qualities. That was a fugue." It's like. Nothing is a fugue, and nothing is counterpoint. Counterpoint is the underlying theory. And so when you do counterpoint exercise, that this book is an exercise book. It's not saying you should always write like this. Because every rule in this book needs to be break it, broken when you, when you actually write music. So these are guidelines. This is just to teach you the, the way, the relationship that music has to itself. I'm going to quote a few things in the introduction to the book. Okay, uh... Haydn, Haydn was a famous composer who taught Mozart. Haydn took infinite pains to assimilate the theories of Fuchs. He went through the whole work laboriously, writing out the exercises, then laying them aside for a few weeks to look them over again later and polish them until he was satisfied he had done everything exactly right. It is likely that Mozart studied Fuchs's works work first under the influence of his father. The copy of the Gratis inscribed 1746 Libris Leopoldi Mozart was with annotations by Leopold Mozart still exists in Salzburg. Uh, Mozart's own study of the Gratis may have been inspired or intensified through the instruction he received from Padre Martini. Martini is another theorist. I read his book. Uh, we know that Martini's counterpoint lessons provided a decisive impulse uh, for Mozart's work and that the Padre declared, we have no system other than that of, Fou- of Fuchs. So hard to say Fuchs without swearing. Okay, so I'm just going to read through some of the highlights I got in the book. Um, so this guy, Albrecht Berger, he was a teacher. I think he like taught, I don't know, everybody. Adapted the uh, cantus firmus of exercises of this book, the Grant Gratis, to major and minor tonalities, and it was primarily in the modified form. 
that the heritage of Fuchs reached the ever-growing number of counterpoint students throughout the 19th century. Uh, Berlioz, Cherubini, Chopin, Rossini, Paganini, Hummel, List, List, all of them uh, read this book. Also Schubert, Bruckner, Brahms. Um, Brahms had a cop, has a copy that's been preserved of this book where he did his exercises and he took notes. Uh, Richard Strauss, Paul Hindemith. Um, uh, I think uh, Hindemith said, uh, it's of practical significance, which no other work on counter contrapuntal theory has attained. Okay, so that's from the introdu introduction of the book. Um, the key thing, though, is that um, this book was written without any knowledge of jo Johann Sebastian Bach's existence. It was written at the same time that Johann Sebastian Bach existed, but without knowledge of him. And it was based on a previous Baroque style of music, which this book ex says is exemplified by Palestrina. And I don't know much about Palestrina. Now, this book is very tiny, but it's very difficult to, uh, to read because it's almost like a math textbook. So I'll explain how it works. Uh, it's actually written as a dialogue between, uh, I think, Fuchs and, uh, and his student. So it's like, it's really weird. It's almost written like Plato, where like they're discussing something. He's like, oh, wow, this is incredible. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome, and you will learn this next. So there's like a strange dialogue. But the, uh, the gist of the book is that counterpoint, the lessons uh, are in species. There's first species, second, third, fourth, and fifth species. That is this book. Now, counterpoint is different than harmony in that it is not the study of the notes so much in terms of their um, vertical relationship, but their horizontal relationship. So, first species counterpoint is a whole note against a whole note. There's a count, cantus firmus, which is just a series of notes that's there for, for the student to then put a note against it to see the relationships. And the, so the first, the first species is one note against another note. And the idea is that horizontally, the notes cannot... It's hard for me to talk about this without bringing in music theory, but... You got perfect intervals and imperfect intervals, and perfect intervals cannot resolve in the same direction. They should be resolving in the opposite directions, um, and they should never be going in the same direction. And so you got one whole note against the whole note, and it's the relationship of that. I think Shanker said that first species counterpoint is really the study of the scale step, but this is way too. I'm not going to get into that. Anyway, so the first species is one whole note against one whole note. The second, and then there's certain rules, like you cannot have similar motion at certain times. You can have similar motion at other times. Species two is two half notes against a whole note. So now we have the concept of the downbeat and the upbeat. So now there's rules. What do you do on the downbeat? What can you not do on the upbeat? And vice versa. Third species is four quarter notes against a whole note. So now it's like, what's the relationship there? What can are the quarter notes allowed to do between the upbeat and the downbeat? All right, fourth species is um, syncopations. And that's where a note is held. It's held over um, on, the, um, on the upbeat. And then it has to resolve on the next upbeat. Syncopations, ties, and there's all sorts of rules for that. And, and syncopations are extremely um, educational in this exercise, in this the way that this is presented, this exercise, these practices, because you're always going to hear syncopations. <coughs> um, like again, I, I was singing the Never Ending Story song, Never Ending Story. Uh, 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 uh. That, I think those are ties. They're either ties or anticipations. So syncopations are always there. Uh, you, idiots like Nirvana use syncopations all the time. 
all music is fraught with it. Anyways, okay, so then fifth species is called florid, and that's just simply where all four species are uh, are used, you know, at, at leisure in the exercise. Oh, and opposed to the other uh, music theorist uh, Rameau, Fuchs believes that a fourth is a dissonance, and this is a big deal. And that is like laid out right away. Um, yeah, what I'll, I'm not gonna. I don't think I have anything more to say because this is just an introduction to the book. Um, a person could speak for hours about this book and what the rules are and why they're there. Um, I've spent, you know, lots of time wondering and asking about why is this? Why do you say that? Why do you say this? Why is it that, you know, the note has to resolve down? Why does the syn- dissonant syncopation have to resolve downward? Um, and I've I've heard I've read other people that have explained it even more. So I guess, okay, so next, uh, I'm done with this one. Next, I'm going to do the CPE Bach book, which is going to be even a hundred times more complicated than this one. And then I'll finish with Schenker, uh, which will be a nice way to end the, the, the quadrilogy because Schenker has a lot to say about Fuchs in his book. And he has a lot to say about CPE Bach. And he has a lot to say about Rameau. It's usually vicious and nasty, though. Okay, bye. If you like gays, click like. If you like blacks, comment. If you like women, click notification bell. If you like gay women, subscribe. And if you like gay black women, uh, Patreon, Human Warnings, give